welcome to Probate Mastery, our weekly mastermind call. I'm Bill Gross, and I am a real estate broker in Los Angeles, California, focused on probate real estate. I'm a graduate of Probate Mastery and use the program every day. And, and the reason why I like to get on here a little early, but I couldn't today because I was finishing a listing presentation that was basically about a 30 minute phone call. And I took a listing earlier this week, yesterday, a listing on a property I've never seen. Basically, I sent out the contract for signature after about a 20 minute phone call. The power of expertise in this market is more valuable than ever. And so the reason why I participate in this program, I do a little coaching kind of for fun as a hobby, but I really more do this because I enjoy it. It sharpens my skills, helps me stay current, challenges me to improve my game as a real estate broker. And this is a market now. We're entering into, into a place where the skill is more viable than just merely energy and relationships. Relationships are important, but relationships are built on something. And if they're built on trust, respect, but then they can really yield great business results. And so I'm going to challenge everybody to learn how to be a better agent rather than learn how to act like one or look like one. Really learn how to be better at our jobs, be better at our business so we create more value for our customers. So we do this every week on Tuesdays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And really the goal of this is to answer questions, encourage those of you who are working on building your business. Maybe you started to probate mastery, you started making phone calls, you started doing mailers, you started building relationships with attorneys or other people. And along the way, we all have challenges, we all have setbacks, we all have bumps in the road. This place we can get together as a group and encourage each other, push each other, solve problems together. And as I was said by Earl Nightingale, you know, when a two or more get together, a third mastermind is created. And so that's what we're hoping to do here on a weekly basis is create a mastermind. So I don't have any particular agenda on this call. I separately host Probate Weekly on Thursdays, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And there I make a point of trying to interview top people every week, attorneys, realtors, vendors, to help us be more specific. But this goal, this call is really to work together, work through problems and find out where issues are and solve them together as a group. What I'll tell you is the, like everything in life, the more you participate, the more value you get out of it. In every relationship, the more you put into it, the more you get out. It seems counterintuitive. And the example I use is my daughter and son-in-law found a little puppy and they're so you know in love with it. Well, what do they do? They save the puppy. And I point out to my son-in-law, see, you, you love the puppy because you did something for it. It hasn't anything for you. And so I'll say here is, is you build your real estate business and probate. If you participate, turn your camera on, ask good questions, give people encouragement, network in the, in the chat box amongst yourselves as well. The more you participate, the more money you make, the more value you create, the better life and better business you have in the long run. If you put in the chat box, what state are you doing business in? What state are you doing business in? Just so we can all kind of network and know where we're at. Florida, my state, we used to live in Florida. Texas, great. Colorado, Colorado, got it. Maryland, Texas, Georgia, New York. Okay, so we have a bit of a mix, very good. So, you know, oftentimes I talk, I, I only practice in less in California. Our laws are different, but the principles are similar. The more and more I learn about other states, the more similar I find other states are principles. And Duane works in Maryland, PA, and West Virginia. Very nice. Eric in Michigan, welcome. And then also you put in the chat box, are you a real estate agent or are you an investor? And if you're both, put the one that you primarily do. I'm an investor. I invest in real estate all the time, but my basic business is I'm a real estate agent. So you're an agent or you're an investor. I mean, you represent other people most of your business time. We don't use the word investor. <laughs> what word do you use, Eric? You don't use the word investor when you talk to customers, maybe property buyer. Okay. So we talk to sellers, you're a property buyer. Very nice. We don't use agent. Oh, okay. Well, we don't use agent. I'm a realtor. Okay, well, Realtors Trademark, that's only people who are members of the Board of Realtors. I'm one of those, too. Real estate agent, very good. Okay, so it looks like a little bit of a mix. And so definitely we want to build a business, I think, that does both. You know, I, I w would like to buy more property as an investor, but I don't, I, I'm not really big on flipping in Los Angeles. Just I'm a little scared by our market. But I do run my business in a way that generates leads for me for investing. So first hand up is Philip Unger. Philip, I didn't notice where you are located, but you are up. How can we help you today? Hi, I'm in Florida, the state you love, though. I probably can't figure out why. But whoa, whoa, whoa. what's it? What what part of Florida are you in? I, I am in Boynton Beach. I'm in West Palm Beach area. Are you still in Boca? Yeah, well, that's that's my goal, you know, is, you know, what I call the holy land. So that's that's my ultimate migration. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, 
we'll leave that aside. Some more houses. Let's get let's get some more sellable listings, then we'll get you into Boca. How's that? My my question is, I'm I'm new to this. I I you know I've gone through the course and I'm trying to. I haven't gotten out there yet because unfortunately I got, I got sick with COVID. I've been down for a few weeks, but I want to get out there. The paradigm I have is uh, is I don't have any kind of good list yet of, of vendors, and I really want to try to walk in to attorneys' offices with with that with you know, something showing that, that I have something and I posted in, in the Facebook page, I haven't gotten much response. If there's any kind of, you know, just even template or a list that, you know, new people like me could follow, like that, like that maybe somebody's willing to share of the different types of vendors that they have that we could say, okay, now, you know, I can go search for these people, you know, cause, cause I can only think of what I think. Of. Right. You so know, this is a common, this is a common question that, that agents get or investors may start the process and, you know, I don't have a list, but I need the list in order to talk to the attorneys. And so I'll never forget, I, I went through a change in my career. I started in the mortgage industry. And at one point, um, because I was you know, financially involved in the company, I was a part owner of the company, we lost everything. And so I went from having, you know, team and assistance and fancy marketing packages and everything to, I got wiped out. And I remember as a salesperson saying, you know, I need to go back to the basics and realize that at the end of the day, I get paid by selling me. And I would, I restructured my whole sales approach where I walk in with a customer with nothing but a pen and notepad, take notes and plain business cards. And, and I say that to you just to, just to emphasize that at the end of the day, you need to accept you're selling you, the product or the service is you. The, everything else is the accoutrement or the tools in your toolbox. When you talk about building your, and, and I've heard Chad say this as well, individually to people, and I and might, might say a little differently, but I know we're on the same page on this. When people say, well, I can't sell because I don't have the toolbox. You walk in with a toolbox, you don't have to have all the tools in there. Because if you get a job that needs a certain tool, you can always run to Home Depot and buy it, right? If you want to use an analogy. And so the thing you have to sell yourself on is you are the service. Think of a service you don't have, you think you need. Like you might think, well, I need a painter. No, you're the service that will solve the customer's painting problem. You just have to commit to if a customer calls you and needs a painter, you're going to find the right painting solution for them. So it's either you have a guy or gal, or you know a guy or gal, or you're going to find a guy or gal. Those are the three possibilities, but all that falls under it's you. Once you accept the person, and that's true, I don't care how good the vendor is. I've been around in this business since 1986. I don't care how good the vendor is, people come and go. It's not the vendor list, it's you. It's you, how do you connect them to the vendor? How do you follow up with the vendor? And then how do you make sure the customer's happy at the end of the day? So I don't care, yeah, I've, I've had customers need things and I would go on and spend two hours going through Yelp reviews and phone calls and, in, and interviewing them and then hustling out and meeting them. But the good news was I found a great vendor, I shot a little video, put that, put that on my social media and I followed up, I introduced them to the customer, they were both happy, followed up afterwards. And so now you're adding to your business. If you're a full-time agent, I noticed there you have the EXP logo, so I assume you're an agent, your business is meeting people. So the fact that you don't have a particular venue get requested is just an opportunity for some focused prospecting in that area. It's not a problem. It shouldn't stop you from meeting with the attorney. Seems to be a very common request. And, and I think well, but here's not- the thing. Here's the thing with that. It is a common request, but from where I sit, it's really just another way to put off. Now, if you said to me, Bill, I'm going right. to take your list. <laughs> I'm going to take your list and I'm going to, you know, my prospecting day is three hours a day. And I'm going to every day set out to fill in that list. That's not going to stop me from talking to attorneys for referrals, but I'm going to work on that list every day. And by the way, as I meet vendors on that list, I'm going to use that to generate some social media content to post on my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my YouTube, whatever. Great, then go ahead and do it. But what I don't want to do is take that list and say, okay, well, as soon as I'm done with this, I'll start going for referrals because you'll never get out, you'll never get out from behind your desk. So that hopefully helps Philip and the rest of you. Okay, so let me say I have some other questions here. Think of what you would need if you were in the position. Yeah, so Debbie has, makes a point make a list based on your needs. And again, I, I think some of this is always a, just a way to put off actually calling people, but the biggest fear is referring a vendor that's shady. Well, great, great concern, Vince, but don't do that. I wouldn't refer somebody unless I know them, unless I tell the customer, you know, I have a couple of prospects. I don't really have one I know, but here's somebody that I've seen. I've read the reviews. I've never used them myself, but I think you have to be, it's really funny when I go into a, I, I run a Facebook group called probate experts. And we're about 1,100 people. Love to have you guys join it. 
and sometimes I'll ask for, do we have any attorneys in Dallas, for example, and people refer me names of people. I'm not going to refer an attorney that I haven't talked to. I'm looking for, is there an attorney in the group that I can then reach out and interview personally? And so I think it's really important that when we make referrals, we appreciate how important it is, both in terms of important to the client and important for us as a chance to build the business and put the extra work in. And I would vet them and make sure they don't send anybody that's shady. Sherry points out the course had a list of vendors. Yeah, I, I took that list and added to my own. And basically the list is kind of the list of, was that list from Public Mastery. And then I basically filled out what I thought I needed to add to that. And then, yeah, again, Vince, don't send anybody that you think is shady. We want somebody to, to be that we can trust and that we feel comfortable sending our customers or prospective customers to. Okay, who else has a question? Raise your hand for the chat box. I think I caught up with everything. How are you keeping in contact with past clients, particularly when the reason people would have come in contact with us was because of death? Belinda, I'm not sure I understand your question. Would you kind of unmute maybe and explain a little more what? what yeah, you're... okay. So, for example, my I have a coach that I'm working with now. She's like, okay, make your list so you can contact all your past fear, which, of course, since the bulk of my um, deals had been through probate. But quite often, those people have been contacted through because, you know, it's a death in the family. Therefore, there's a property that's now available for the needs to be sold. Okay. Some cases, you know, it's not that big of a deal. There's no like raw pain, raw emotion there. But other cases, you know, it's just, it's just such a painful thing. Somebody died early, soon, whatever. So I don't know, maybe I'm being a little bit, a little bit too much, too dramatic, but it just feels to me like it. For me to associate with them, they are associating me with the death and the, that, that pain experience and that challenge portion in their life. So it so doesn't feel that comfortable like to stay in contact. I'm just wondering, how do you do that? Or you probably view it a different way. Well, again, so when I hear that question, what I really hear is I'm not really making the phone calls. I'm not the most sensitive guy in the world that we can't tell. I work at it. You know, I'm a human being. I, 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 I'm sensitive that I'm talking to humans, but... Uh, you know, I have people I talk to who, you know, it's a probate lead and I call them back in 90 days. I don't find them emotionally or tying me to the death of the person. Oh, um, no, no, no. I, I, I meant, okay, this is like way later. These are people I've done deals with through probate. It's been like four or five years. Okay. I right. Well, I, I get that. So, I get that. Yeah. I, yeah. So, yeah. so, so here's the so thing. It's, been, it's you. It's not them because frankly, okay. they, they're going to remember you as the realtor that sold their house five years ago, not the realtor who sold their dead mother's house. They okay, just, okay. It's just not, they don't think of you that way. My own, at least that's not my experience. Okay. Okay. And so if you make just, more calls. Maybe just, just me reading too much into it. Thinking it is. too much into it. Okay. It is. All right. Okay. All the fear about people treating, look, if you call, if you talk to hundred people, will one or two be offended or think of you that way? Yes, of course. There's always people like that. There's always people who project on you their mistakes or their problems. Don't let that get in the way of the other. And here's the other thing. If you really believe you're helping the families you're reaching out to, then you feel obligated to make those phone calls. You won't let it stop you. So sometimes the reason why you're not making the calls is because you don't think you're really creating value for them. You think you're just another agent. Find value to have for them when you call. Information that they want to know. Do they have their property in an estate plan? Are they watching the real estate market? Are they nervous about the real estate market? Whatever it is, when you call, you should have the attitude that I'm of value to you and therefore we should talk about, you know, and, and take the call. And if you don't feel that way, then you probably shouldn't be making the phone call. But the source of the problem is your insecurity. It's not about them. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks, Belinda. Belinda, where do you do business? I think in Maryland you said last time, right? Yes. So it's, it's in Maryland. I mean, I'm yeah. in Laurel, Maryland. So I do a lot of my business in Prince George's County, Maryland. Not getting a lot of leads from the source that I, I had been getting them from U.S. probates. So I was going to go down to the courthouse. You know, I took the EARN course. I'm not quite finished with it yet, but I just got through with the portion that you did about networking when we're down there. And then the attorney afterwards, you know, how to talk to an attorney, stuff like that. So my approach really was going to be to, I'm going down to the courthouse to get leads, to be seen, that kind of thing. And just, you know, they'll see me as a regular, but I'm going to do it twice a week. I'm not going to go every day and it won't be all day, maybe say from nine to 12 on Mondays and Wednesdays, collect leads, hopefully be able to attend the orphan's court and just see how things work and get me really familiar with the whole process. And my thought on how to get interactions with attorneys would be more so as I acquire um, clients that actually have attorneys, contact go. those attorneys because we have a common yes. interest, you know, 100%. and then just do a slam dunk job and then, you know, follow up. That's going to be my approach, you 100%. know, rather than, yeah. 
but I am going to dress appropriately going down to the courts. Now, since you mentioned that, you know, not so casual, I wouldn't have done shorts anyway, but you know, maybe slacks in the top instead of, you know, very casual. Well, I, I, it's funny. I'm, I'm the same spot in the class you are. I just finished my own section in urn. Okay. Up. But I do emphasize if you're going to go to court, you should dress like an attorney because you want, if you're looking to meet attorneys and get their respect and approval, yeah. everybody naturally is more connected to somebody who's like them and, and whatever that means. And, and so you want to dress like them and, and there's an equivalent like them for men and women, but you should dress like female attorneys do in court. So every court's a little different. Santa Clara court's totally different than LA court. But you want to look like an attorney, whatever that means to you. So through the and are you an agent or investor? Well, I'm a realtor, but I want to acquire a few, you know, buy and hold properties. You know, mm -hmm. there, there's been some opportunities as I've gone through with probates, and I just wasn't in a position to do that. So hopefully, you know, I'll get in a position to do that. But that's the goal. Very good. Realtor and then a buy and hold investor. Very good. Linda Reese in Prince George's County, Maryland. Thank you for for the update. Come back and let's okay. know how you're doing in court there. Okay. Yeah. And the EARN program, for those who don't know, so, so Chad's basic program is probate mastery, which is kind of the overview of probate, getting you started in the business, kind of the come from, how you deal with customers and such, building a business plan in that. And then he built a specific niche product to add on to that called EARN, which is EARN Attorney Referrals Now. And it turns out I'm one of the guest lecturers on that and on the one of the chapters, I actually do it on how to go to court and earn business there. So there's a package price if you're interested in that detail. Okay, other questions? If you have a question, raise your hand or put it in the chat box. Vince says, has anyone bought a product or service over the phone? The point is making phone calls to leads wouldn't be worth the time to a large portion of population. The purpose, of course, is different with COVID. The purpose of the phone call is to try to get an appointment. And so oftentimes you find somebody who has a problem. And if you can give them something that will solve the problem, it moves you forward in working with them. So in the EARN program, Chad talks about the you know, trespassing signs and personalizing them, of being a value. I've offered to go to properties to walk them, to take pictures, to see what's going on for remote or you know, out-of-state administrators or, or executors. And sometimes it's just simply helping them with a problem. If you can find what the problem is, you can help them on the phone, then you can move forward in the relationship. So I, I can't say too often that I get people to buy my service just in a phone call. That said, when people come to me already having seen me as an expert based on my social media, website, video, and such, and a referral from an attorney or from another agent, that usually is just a 30 minute phone call. I don't really have to go see them. I don't have to go through a lot of discussion. I don't talk about a commission. And, you know, literally Monday morning, I sent out a proposed contract to a seller and called them up to messages and said, I'd like to talk to you about it. And it came back signed. So I will say that the phone can be the, a portion of the process, but it's not the whole thing. I don't think I would agree with you. Over the phone offers automatically triggers me. There are too many auto dialer marketers out there. They're shady. Okay, fine. Then don't use auto dialers. I, I don't use one either. So, okay, good. Are there good examples of websites anyone uses to add credibility? That's asked by Brad. So I use all the leads.com has a website and I pay for that. And then with their agreement, I, I got them to agree that if I pay for it, I want to be able to use the content on my own personal website. I'm not selling it to anybody, but I have a company issued website that's a little stronger than using somebody else's website that's hosted. I don't know necessarily the website is the end. I think the website is the beginning. And then you need to put in your own content and customize. Because I think when people see not just my website, but the videos and the YouTubes and such, and I would encourage all agents in probate, pick the area that you're specializing in and go into detail. Do a video at your court. Do a video with local attorneys that you work with. Do videos with happy customers. Do videos of probate properties for sale. We all have opportunities to do that. And I think that when customers see you engage in the process, I was on a listing appointment at 1130, referred by somebody, and the, the petitioner was saying to me how he had talked to somebody else who said they're a probate expert, they didn't have any certifications. He said, I have one. Well, the truth is I have four. I don't put them all in the, my email or whatever. As I said to, the, to him, it's not the certification. I actually teach a class. You all could say, I'm on part of a national mastermind group that meets every Tuesday at noon or whatever time it is for you. And that we literally have a group that we're parts of that have over a thousand members. That expertise is not a destination. It's a process. And so when you talk to customers, it's not just the website, but it's what are you doing with it? And so sharing that you're here on this, participating, maybe getting the video clip or sharing the video 
on your YouTube channel. All those are ways, take a picture of it, putting it in your channel, that you participate in it. All those are ways that you can add credibility to yourself to take your website to another level. So I would say websites are great, but you want to, it's really about what you do with it. Tools are great. It's what you do with the tools that are going to make the difference with people. Okay, Chris says, calls are not only for leads. I spoke with an attorney on Friday who doesn't typically take on probates involving underwater real estate, which he specializes in, not a deal today, but potential future relationship to add value. Okay, I think, you know, if the phone is, is a tool and it's usually used to either start or further relationships. You know, I call my key attorneys every 30 days and just touch base with them. I talked to one yesterday he's on vacation, but he took my call just because he likes talking to me. So definitely a phone's an important tool, but I would definitely say you need to talk to people regularly and talk to more people if you want to make more money. Uh, Chris, I may have a deal for you actually, by the way. So we need to, after the call, maybe exchange emails. Claire Monique says she completed the mastery program and in the process of the EARN course. You, you, you and me, honey, together on that one. I'm on the EARN, I'm on chapter 11. And, and I actually, I, I'm the instructor in chapter 10. So it's a lot of material there. You know, it's a lot, it's a lot there for the value. So uh Good luck with that. How's it working for you, Claire Monique? Are you, are you feel are you learning? Are you, are you able to put some of this into practice right away? I know when I took when I took uh, coaching with Chad the first time, literally within that week, I, I got some nice listings that made, I made a lot of money on because he got me into action and thinking the right way about people. Debbie says, I'm a member through the probate master course and then going to go to earn. Good. Good for you. Good luck with that. Let's know how you do with that. DUI asks, what is underwater real estate? So DUI, what he was saying is that there's a property where more is owed on it than it's worth, or maybe more is owed on it when you add in the cost to sell the property than it's worth. And so there's a whole process. How do you take that over? Sometimes you negotiate with the lender and reduce the mortgage. Sometimes you take it subject to, there's a different ways to work with underwater real estate. And Chris happens to specialize in that. Claire says, unable to put things in action yet. Well, Claire, Monique, let's get on it. Let's get into action. And iPhone says you're on module six of her. so I... I don't know what module I'm on. I think there's like modules and then within modules, there's chapters or something. So like I said, I'm on 11. So good. Let's all, let's all commit to work on that. I'm working on that every day. I, I, I'm tired of Chad embarrassing me that I haven't finished it all. So I'm definitely I paid for it and I'm going to get the most out of it. Okay. Other questions, challenges, problems, who's having a challenge with their program or putting it in action. This is all about action. The only reason I'm on here, I believe you guys need a swift kick in the, we all do, me included. Swift kick in the rear end and do more action and less, less talk, less preparation. Okay, Valerie just finished mastery last night. I'm hungry, capital H. So she's hungry to do a good job. Good, Valerie, let's get into action. Let's talk to people today. How about we commit to calling some people today so we can be successful? There's Eric. Let's see if this will get him. Hey, Eric. Bill, can you hear me any better? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I was driving. So yeah, re regarding, you know, going back to the action thing, I've been buying property full time for 17 years. Probates used to be a, a main source of how I used to buy properties. And then 10 years ago, I moved down to Boca, kind of was done buying. And now that I've been doing probate or real estate again for the last four years, probates have been really, really tough for me to crack the code again. It seems like the only probate deals that I buy are the ones that we identify while we're driving for dollars. And it just happens to be a probate situation. Got a natural vendor list. I've got a website for it, but man, these old, these objections people hit us with over and over, I just can't seem to overcome. And the one thing that I have plastered above my desk that I tell my team every single week, we talk about our probate business is nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Nobody wants to give us the time because they shut us down so quickly. So, so here's the thing about whether it be phone calling or prospecting in general. I would say two things to the conversation. This this will apply to everybody. Number one, business is has gotten more challenging every day. That's just the nature of business. Competition every day. There's people who improve, work harder, learn more, new people in, new blood, new energy. Every business. Every business you ever talk to anybody, if you think about it, it's gotten more challenging. I remember when I was young, there was an amazing book in 1980, In Search of Excellence, where they interviewed the top companies in America. One of them was McDonald's. They attributed McDonald's success at that time to only focusing okay. on a few products, where McDonald's only made hamburgers, cheeseburgers, fries, milkshakes, maybe flip fish or something. Today, McDonald's makes everything, breakfast and coffee and salads and fruit. Business got more competitive. And so when I talk to investors who've been in the business a while, and I hear this a lot, the margins are slimmer and or you have to talk to more people to find a deal. So as an investor, I think there was a time 
when maybe you would talk to 100 people to find a deal. And now maybe it's 200 people to find a deal. That's the business we're in. And you're either in the business or you're not. And it's, and we don't have to like it. We don't have to like that it's harder. I'm 63 years old. I work pretty hard. I don't really have to work, but I have to work for the lifestyle I want to have. So I, I would just say to you, you know, it's a mindset part. It sounds to me like you're frustrated. Yes, you, can, you probably have to talk to twice as many contacts in the past to find a deal. And yes, the deals that are there are probably lower margins than you're used to. My suspicion is that's true for all the properties you buy. That That's all I ever hear from investors is how tight the margins are compared to where they were a year or two ago, or five years ago. So but that's the business rent. At the same time, you can make more money in this business than anything I'm aware of. And so I would just, you know, maybe what you're doing isn't working and, and you need to talk to more people or get better at the people you talk to. Those are our two choices. I also always feel like we have to come from owning it. It's never them. It's not that they don't give you enough time to develop the relationship is where you're not good enough or your caller's not good enough to develop the relationship in the time they have or using the tactics they're using. And so we, we can blame the prospect and be right about it, or we can take responsibility and say, well, what do I have to do to be better so that next time they'll choose to connect with me? And I would urge you to consider the second, take responsibility for that and, or have your phone call or take responsibility for that. And that's where the solution lies. You can then start working on, well, was I empathetic enough? Am I speaking the way they speak? you know, record the phone calls and listen to them. I used to do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I would charge a thousand dollars a month years ago. Now I, would, you know, I charge a higher rate than that. The number one tool to improve your phone calling is just record yourself and then listen to it. If, if it's legal where you're at, just listen to yourself prospecting. It's shocking. You, it, it's the most difficult thing to do. It's heartbreaking. It's embarrassing. I, I, I hate it. I want to vomit. I want to shoot myself, but it helps me improve. And so for anybody, if you're asking questions about how to be better on the phone calling to get better results, I would start with record your calls. And I think you'll, there'll be some clues there as what you can do better. Okay. Stephen Hughes, hand up. Let me get you unmuted. If you can turn your, your camera on, love to have you join in as well. There yeah. You are. Definitely. Yeah. Salt Lake City, Utah. I asked a couple questions in the past. I've been making more and more calls. This is probably a fairly common phone objection. Just wanted to get insight on it. You know, I go through kind of the pitch of, hey, we're a social networking group, and even at the risk of possibly offending you, we reach out to families because there's things that the court and attorneys don't always cover. You know, is there anything we could help you when it comes to real property, personal property, or just any other questions? And, you know, they'll sit there a lot of times, and this is what I get, and I'll tell you how I'm moving past it, but I'm hoping for some other ideas. They'll say, oh, we're taken care of. We've got everything figured out. And then I say, okay, I think that's great. I'd still like to ask a couple of questions. I've seen a couple of bad cases. Do you have a vacant home associated with the estate? You know, and, and a lot of times they say no. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. And then I go into stuff about insurance and squatters because I've actually come across a couple of people even here in Utah that have squatters in there. And uh, that seems to help a little bit with rapport. I want to understand them a little bit more, that, that deflection, like where they're just like, oh, we've got it covered. We, we have everything handled. Back with my FISBO and expired days, it's like just trying to get you off the phone. But I feel like there could be something deeper on their end, and I'd like to understand them a bit more. I don't know. Do you have any insight on that? Well, so a couple of things I would say. First thing, record yourself and listen to yourself. Okay. We can role play it here. In fact, let's, let's, let me just share a couple ideas, then we can role play real quick. But I would say that just the way you discussed it up front, the scripting, I wouldn't talk about what's going to offend them or social media. I wouldn't put that thought in their mind. I would get more okay. to the point. Okay. I would only talk about things that are important to them. If they don't have a vacant house, I wouldn't talk about vacant houses. I'd ask the question. Yeah. But I, would, I wouldn't talk about it. So the other thing I want to leave everybody with is the three-step process. Anything somebody says is not a condition. So a condition is well, we sold the property a year ago. Mm -hmm. The condition is we're not going to sell the property. Though in reality, you know, like any seller, they're not selling it now, but they might sell it in two years or eight years. So you, you still want to develop the relationship. But that's a condition that's selling right now. The condition could be, you know, my mother's a realtor or that could be an objection. But anything else is an objection. Right. And we handle all objections with the same three-step process. And, and you skip the number one. Number one is repeat what they say. The number one complaint people have with realtors and salespeople is they don't listen. True or false? True. How do I let them know that I'm listening? By repeating what they say. Second, make them okay. The next mistake realtors make is we argue with people too much. We, didn't, we never argue with a prospect. Ever, ever, ever. We affirm whatever, whatever they say is, as wrong as we might think it to be, we 
uh, affirm it. We don't agree with it. We affirm that's their position and we're okay if that's their position. So if I called you and we'll role play and I'd say, hey, Stephen, Bill Gross calling. I see you filed a probate. I have a team that helps families like yours with probates. I'm calling to see if we can be of assistance. And you're going to say to me, we've got everything covered. We've got everything covered. Fantastic. Let me ask you this. Is the property vacant or occupied? My, my, my nephew staying in it. Now notice what I did. I repeated, affirmed, mm -hmm. and I went to the next question. And so we can go deeper and deeper on that scenario. My, my, you know, my nephew could be good news or bad news. The nephew could be, I'm glad to have him in the house. Or the, or the nephew could be, he's a squatter. And if you could shoot him and drag him out, we'd be happy. But the key point is on the, any objection, that's the three-step process. Repeat affirm, not agree, but we're affirming, well, okay, great, you have everything handled. Well, let me ask you this, and then you throw out a question that you hope to dig a little deeper and find an opportunity to be of service. You're looking for a chance to help them. Mm -hmm. And then what, what I always would say, and this kind of goes back to the last question as well, anytime the customer treats you like a telemarketer, that's because you sound like a telemarketer. Mm -hmm. Before they picked up the phone, they weren't talking to a telemarketer. They only talked to a telemarketer after you called them. Yeah. So we need to look at our own selves and say, what I do that that person, like, I, I can't speak for you, Stephen, but I know me. I'm an expert in this. I'm calling giving them advice worth thousands of dollars for free. What did I do that they didn't appreciate that? And how can I get them to appreciate that? That's the key. Mm -hmm. So we have to start with that. And I'd say the best way is listen, you record yourself, listen to your calls and see if you are being as open and sensitive and friendly as opposed to being a telemarketer. Just check yourself and, and come back next week. Let me know what you think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Does, does it help a bit? Yes. I, I did have a follow-up question real quick. If, if, sure. if, do you think it's okay to ask about their intentions on a first call with the property? Like, do you, you guys keep plan on renting it out, keeping in the, in the family? Are you looking to sell it? What do you guys think? Do you think it's too soon on a first call to ask that? No, I think you can ask the question. You know, I noticed there's a, there's a property attached to the probate. It looks like 123 Main Street. And I'm a real estate agent. I'm just going to see if I can help you. Are you plan to sell the property or what are your plans with it? I think you can ask the question. Okay. Don't argue with them. And, you know, oftentimes they'll say, well, we're still evaluating. Oh, great. So, again, you're still evaluating. Great. So, I'm curious, what are you thinking about? You think of renting it? You think of improving it? What do you think of doing with the property? Yeah. And can you help them? If they say we're thinking of renting it, could you help them? Get them rental comps, show them the process, give them a, a link to what's involved in renting property in your neighborhood. If they think of fixing it up, could you help them with that? Could you yeah. just give them some resources on that? So again, our, our goal is to get a conversation and then ultimately a relationship with them. And the phone's the way we do that. Okay. Okay? Right. Fantastic. Thanks. Okay. So Chris says, spoke to an administrator who was interested in selling without a realtor. We negotiate back and forth, alternate with another cash buyer offer off up home days. Okay. Yeah. So that's the process. As Chris says, more calls equals more opportunities. So I would say to real estate agents, I coach on my team, if you want to make more money, talk to more people and get better at the people you talk to. Those are the only two things you can do. Talk to more people and get better. And one way to get better is to talk to more people. So the number is important. Dwayne asks, any thoughts about using KV Core for this? So Dwayne, are you using KV Core right now? No. Uh-uh. What are you using currently? Not much. Well, I'm just at the beginning. Anything's better than nothing. So the question really is what CRM should I use? And you know, the, the, I actually did a, a video years ago on your database is your business and some steps to kind of consolidate everybody, you know, into one spot. It doesn't really matter to me what that one spot is, but from that one spot, you need to be able to take action, whether it be email people, call people, categorize, take notes and such. You can use Google Contacts or Outlook. You can use a spreadsheet. I'm with the XP, as is Dwayne, and we get, as a result, KV Core as a, as a CRM, a customer relationship management software program as part of that package. I don't think it matters which one you use. It's important that you use a place you put everybody in one place. It's important that you communicate with everybody regularly. I recommend to my team we email every week. We post on social media several times during the week, and we call everybody a minimum of every 90 days. You know, past clients, some of the influence and such. And of course, leads would call more often than that. you have particular questions about KV Core or is that just a general question? I've heard that there are ways to adapt it more specifically for doing this business. And that's, that's, that's what I'm asking. So I would say that 
you know, most software program, think of it as a tool and it's all about how you use the tool. I know it, in our company, we have a ton of in-house training on how to use it. And that's what makes it effective. It's not that necessarily KV Core is better than any other software having used a lot. And it's an area I think I'm an expert in, but it's not the software. It's how you use the software. It's not the man in the fight, but the fight in the man. And so it really gets down to how you use it and how you implement it for your business in particular. And, and everybody's business is a little different. You know, personally, I'm focused on attorney referrals and investor agent referrals. If you're focused on calling petitioners, then you can use it differently than I am. But it's a powerful tool. I think it would cover everything you're trying to do. It just depends on how you're trying to implement it. Okay. I'm glad to go into details. You're going to discuss your business in detail. The only way to give you a more detailed answer is to go into your business in particular. Okay. So Vince asked a question, are you looking to close the prospect or would you be asking if you could follow up with an email or letter would that suffice? So Vince, so the, the purpose of prospecting is to generate a relationship that many of them end up in doing business together. And so I think you always have to have in mind what's the next step in a relationship, whatever that is. Sometimes next step is meeting them in person. But if they're out of state, the next step might be a video presentation. And then a preparation that you might send things ahead of time. So it depends. I don't know how to answer that's always going to work for you. But I would say in general, when we make phone calls, you know, for me, it's about talking to them in a way that gets them to consider me as their resource for their probate. And then the next step, if they're interested, is to present what that would mean and what they might, why they would need me. And oftentimes that includes a contract and a estimated net sheet to walk through. This is how I do it. And this is what I would do in, in my marketing system or recommendations for them. So generally the next step is to meet them. And then the next step after that is to make a presentation as to why they should choose you and then to get a contract signed. So I don't know how much more I could explain it than that, but it's a pro relationships are a process. They're a marathon, not a sprint. If phone calls feel like a sprint, then that's probably part of your mindset and you have to understand what the purpose of it is. You know, I'm in the business of talking to people and I have people call me, you know, and in, enter in, in my calendar all day long. And I, I do marketing, so I have more inbound people looking for me and setting appointments on my calendar that I talk to. But when I have holes in my calendar, I make outbound phone calls. And I'm looking for people that appreciate me and have a problem I can help them solve. And so I think you need to come from a mindset of where you can be of assistance to people. Sherry asks, is there a private group for people that enrolled in the EARN class? What a great idea, Sherry. I don't know of one, but I'd like to be in it if there is one. Let me send it out to Kat and McKenna and see if we can't create one. That'd become a fun thing for people in the EARN program, both in process and completed. Unfortunately, it's too many that are in process like me. I haven't finished it yet, but there's a lot there. To, to Chad's credit, he really wants to give. There's, a, there's an ancient Jewish saying, which is more than the calf wants the milk, the mother wants to give the milk to the calf. And I think a great coach, a sign of it is they want to give more to us than we as students are ready to, to take on. So that's a, that's a, Sherry, that's the idea of the week. I'm going to give you two brownie points for that one. I'd like that a lot. And so I'll do my best to make that happen. Just do it on my own. If, if Chad doesn't like it. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, good. Any other questions? Any other suggestions? How can we make that program better? I liked it. There's still a lot there. I'm not even finished with it. I thought the no trespassing idea was great, though I just use regular signs. But the idea of, of offering to do that, I think is a fantastic idea in the EARN program. Okay, Valerie, I want to start going to probate court to learn the process. What are some tips once I get there, how to navigate the information on recent probate files? Valerie, what, what county, or what state, and what county are you in? Because it varies by state. The, the process, let me unmute you if you're available. Um, yes, I'm available. Could you hear me? Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm in Atlanta. I'm actually Atlanta. in... Ro yes, <laughs> it's very hot here. I'm in Roswell, so north of Atlanta. Kind bougie of area of Atlanta. Yeah, kind of bougie, but you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like, I like just it. Just own it, lady. Just own it. <laughs> <laughs> and so what is that... Uh, what county is that? Is that... Fulton, North Fulton. Fulton County. So Fulton, I think, is the largest or second largest county in America for probate. LA and I think Fulton go back and forth. And so it's mm -hmm. very, you know, very active court. Have you taken probate mastery? I finished it last night. Good for you. And are you the one who said you're taking earn as well? I have not taken okay. earn. So in the I earn program, chapter, chapter 10 is probate court networking. I actually do a kind of a half hour and it was a group call 
on tips. So I, I can't do a whole half hour now. I got about two minutes left. But what I will say, just in general, be clear on what your purpose for going is, right? If you're going there to learn probate court so that you can be of service to your clients, go there with that mindset. If you're going there with the idea of meeting attorneys and, and, and prospecting there, then go there with that mindset. So you get clear on why you're going. I would go the first time or two just to learn the lay of the land and, and explore and say, what opportunities are there for me? That's what I did. Chad challenged us on probate mastery to go once. So I went once. I spent a whole day walking around and just figuring out where all the rooms were and where the computers were and sitting in the court was fascinating. And I decided to go back the rest of the week. And then from there, I stayed there for a month. And then I wrote a business plan and went there every day for three hours to start my day prospecting. That was pre-COVID. I don't think you could do that today the same way that I did then. Not in Los Angeles, maybe in other counties you can. Maybe you will be able to someday. But with so much now online, there's less people in the court. So I don't know it's as effective. But I would definitely urge you to go and just go there, blot out a whole day if you can. Just walk around and learn, take notes, just get a feel. Where's the postings? Where's the other computers? Who are the staff? Because when you talk to people on the phone, you now become a resource. Generally, you can't take pictures or video in the courthouse. Um, most courthouses don't allow it, but you can outside. So it'd be a nice piece for social media to be at the courthouse and maybe share one or two things you learned at the courthouse. I think would be a really good, effective message for your clients as well. Okay. okay? Thank Hope you. That helps. My pleasure. McKenna, I see your hand up. Let's get you unmuted. And how can we get you to jump in here? Uh, yeah, there was just a question earlier about whether or not Earn has a community, and I just wanted to respond to that. So as of right now, we are using a state professionals mastermind as the primary community, but keep in mind, probate mastery is kind of our, our core course. And then, you know, Chad teaches this two prong approach as far as collecting leads. One of which is, you know, using a software such as all the leads. And then another one is to build your vendor network. And so earn is kind of a deep dive into that second prong approach. And so instead of creating an entirely new community around what we're kind of envisioning is the fact that EARN is a little bit more of a additional teaching on top of probate mastery. And we actually recommend that probate mastery is a prerequisite for EARN. Yeah. So a lot of our, you know, probate mastery students who are in this call or, you know, alumni who are in this call will also be taking EARN or are still interested in EARN, but you can use this group maybe as an opportunity to talk about both courses. And then as far as the Facebook group, you know, we have the Probate Mastery Alumni group, but Estate Professionals Mastermind is what we're trying to grow right now because eventually we'd like to add more and more courses that kind of correlate with what it is that Chad's already teaching on. There you go. There's the official word from McKenna who runs everything. I'm just, just the hired help. I'm just glad to be here. McKenna, thank you for the detailed explanation. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. He's also a lot nicer than I am, so if you haven't noticed. So good. Thanks, thanks, McKenna. Okay, so I think we have to wrap it up, though. I would say continue the conversation in the Facebook group, Probate Mastery Alumni Group, or the state group as well, and Facebook group are great places to go. I, I'm on there every day. So if you have more questions, we can get to you, or you have you know deeper dives on those questions, go there, post them, and I'll try to get to them, and or Kat or McKenna or Chad will jump in and answer some of those questions. So this particular call we do every Tuesday, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, this is really designed for people who are in the process of probate mastery, learning to build their business and wealth through um, building a business on probate real estate. I'm Bill Gross. I'm, uh, I host this. I'm glad to do that. I look forward to seeing you guys down the road and hopefully see you next week. If you put questions in the chat on the YouTube or the Facebook group, I'll catch up with you there. And until then, have a great week. Thanks, everybody.